Okay, so the record button's on. This is Sun Lee from Save the Children. We're going to start the FRESH webinar. Um, as you know, FRESH is a community of researchers and practitioners and policymakers on education and health, and we host webinars every month on topics related to children's health and well-being. This month, we're celebrating World Food Day, which is tomorrow, and the theme this year is Healthy Diets. With over 820 million people suffering from hunger and even more from overweight and obesity, healthy diets means nutritious foods for everyone, everywhere. To understand what actions we must take to ensure healthy diets and meet our 2030 goal for nutrition, speakers from UN Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, will speak to us on the topic of holistic food and nutrition education for healthy and sustainable diets. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. We have two speakers. First speaker is Fatima Hachem, team leader, nutrition education and consumer awareness group, and the nutrition and food systems division of FAO. After Fatima, we have Melissa Vargas. She's the international national International Nutrition Consultant within the Nutrition and Food Systems Division within FAO. Um, Melissa and Fatima and Yanuri are the FAO core team working globally with school-based food and nutrition education. I'm gonna mute, okay, sorry. Uh, welcome again to our speakers, and we're going to hand it over to Fatima to get the get us started with the webinar. And um, for all those other listeners, please make sure that you stay muted. Um, and then when we have time for questions during that time, we can have you call in, or you can type your questions into the chat box. But we're going to start with Fatima. Over to you. Fatima, I'm going to unmute you because you're muted. Yes. Fatima, go ahead. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for the others who are in their second half of the day. Uh, my name is Fatima Hashem, and I'm the uh, team leader for the Nutrition Education and Consumer Awareness Group here in FAO in Rome. And today, two of my colleagues will be joining me uh, in this presentation, uh, and uh, some of you have introduced uh, the team. Um, yes, as, as you have said, we are ce celebrating the uh, uh, World Food Day, which happens to be tomorrow, but of course it's the week of celebration. So uh, we're starting here early. So uh, yes, the theme is on healthy diets and it's uh, about our actions and all what we do to make our diets healthy and not only us as consumers, it's all the actors in the food system. FAO is um, act, uh, working towards a sustainable, uh, like to, towards a vision that uh, ensures sustainability of food systems in their local context to deliver on healthy diets and sustainable diets. So um, this is our um, um, uh, poster for this year. And uh, why are we uh, uh, concerned about healthy diets? Okay, so for the second, for the next slide, we will uh, just give you um, some brief. Uh, th these are the uh, outlines of our presentation. So we will give you a brief uh, about the uh, role of school-based food and nutrition education in promoting healthy and sustainable diet. Then Yonori will be uh, telling us about the current school food and nutrition education situation in low and middle income countries. And uh, Melissa will tell us what is needed to improve school food and nutrition education uh, impact in low and middle income countries. And then I will wrap up by uh, telling you a bit about what FAO is doing to support governments in enhancing the effectiveness and scope of school food and nutrition education interventions. So um, the next, please. 
So we will start with the same question, uh, first question, what's the role of school food, uh, school-based food and nutrition education in promoting healthy and sustainable diets? Uh, so we have uh, FAO and uh, partners launched in July uh, a report on the state of food insecurity and nutrition in the world. And the figures are actually uh, alarming. We know that over uh, 820 million people are still hungry today. Uh, we uh, know that uh, if we add to this number, those who are in moderate uh, uh, food insecurity, we, we will be talking about higher numbers, but we are also seeing an increase, an alarming increase in the number of overweight and obese uh, uh, people in the world, but uh, for our target, the uh, for children five to nine years old, we have over 130 million who are uh, uh, overweight and 207 million adolescents overweight. So this, these numbers are very, very alarming. We also know that anemia is a very important challenge among children, school age children. Of course, also you will say women uh, in child uh, uh, bearing age, but this is, uh, we are focusing now on children. This is a global challenge in all countries. And we know from the recent uh, publications that poor diets are leading uh, risk factors for the global burden of disease. Uh, so uh, in, uh, I would talk about both ends of malnutrition. We treat nutrition in all its forms and diets are contributing to what we are seeing as increasing numbers of obese and overweight people in the world, but also to, we should not forget that poor diets are also contributing to undernutrition. Well, we do know that there, there are drivers for all these uh, um, changes. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the change in lifestyle is very important. The, the way we uh, 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 live now is different. We are more uh, sedentary globally and we are not, uh, uh, our uh, food patterns uh, have changed. A lot of changes, uh, changes are happening, especially in low uh, uh, income countries, which are exceeding, uh, to, uh, like uh, uh, getting higher incomes and becoming rich fast with a, a high population uh, growth rates in the same countries they are pushing uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, hard on our resources so our dietary patterns are changing our production practices are changing the food system in fact is as we saw in the second international conference on nutrition the food system was blamed for it not uh, uh, delivering on healthy diets, but not only that, our food systems are only uh, contributing to the negative impact on the environment. And it's not only the greenhouse gas emissions, it's also all other indicators related to the environment, uh, carbon dioxide and the rest. So we also waste a lot of our food and the socioeconomic inequalities are growing along, uh, uh, along the food system. So we are really in a situation where we should care about the uh, provision of healthy diets and sustainable diets. And we see a very important role for uh, uh, food and nutrition education in schools to contribute to this, to, to a change in the paradigm. Next, please. So why, why do we believe in that? It's because we, you, you, we all know that uh, countries need to uh, uh, progress towards achieving the goals of the uh, Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, uh, also we, uh, a lot of countries have committed to the right to food and to right to food not only in the terms of quantity but also quality. So here is where the link to the school food and nutrition education we believe that school food and nutrition education can contribute to at least six of the six, uh, SDGs. We all know that they con uh, they, they, there is a link be between uh, uh, changing uh, um, uh, what, uh, what uh, people, I mean, these, uh, we are talking about uh, children in, the, in schools as future consumers, future adults that will be uh, responsible for their actions. So we want Want to work with uh, uh, with them and for them to have food and nutrition competencies. We will we want to work through their uh, on improving their skills for life 
and their knowledge and understanding, their attitudes and perceptions, and we want them to be motivated to, so, to do so. And this is uh, how, how the school food and nutrition education can be uh, uh, important in uh, con connecting to the sustainable development uh, goals because for poverty, for quality of education, I will not uh, uh, tell you all the SDGs, but at least six, as I said, as SDG one, two, three, uh, four, all these are very important, uh, importantly linked to, to the education uh, in schools. So a population with good health uh, is, is not only promoting uh, uh, sustainability, but it's also promoting health for future generations. Why? Because we know that poverty and malnutrition are, uh, go from one generation to the next. So uh, uh, we do have this vicious circle. And if we can ensure that we have uh, uh, children that are uh, ready to take the right actions and the, to, to, to uh, behave in the right way towards themselves and their future families and towards the environment, then we would be sure that we have uh, participated in, in achieving the sustainable development goals. So this is, this is the context. I will leave uh, now, um, uh, the, the, uh, I will leave it to you, Nori, to explain to you what we have been doing, in fact, in order to uh, push this agenda further. So we will move on to the second question. So if, if yes, and that is what's the current school food and nutrition education situation in low and middle income countries. And I just want before giving the, the uh, uh, microphone to uh, Yonori, I just want to say that with F in FAO, we give uh, a lot of attention uh, to low and middle income countries because of the lower capacities, because it's our mandate to assist countries that need our assistance. But this doesn't mean that we don't work in uh, countries uh, uh, that have high income or classified as having high income, but we, we uh, learn from them and we share experiences, but our focus in this presentation will be in the, on the low uh, uh, and middle income countries. You know it. Thank you, Fatima, and good, mor good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Um, so this section, as Fatima said, the question is, what is the current school food and nutrition situation in low and middle income countries? And what I'm going to do is to share with you the most recent work that FAO has been doing to provide a comprehensive answer to this question. So in this slide that you have, uh, is basically to set the context and to set that context, it is important to note that as part of the efforts for achieving the global targets from the SDGs, as Fatima was saying, and also for making smart commitments for the UN decade of action on nutrition, it's necessary to have evidence and data about school food and nutrition education interventions. But this data must be available it must be accessible, it has to be clear and accurate to the context of many of our low and middle income countries so that decision makers, governments and programmers will be able to know or most importantly to have the tools to answer the following four questions. Next slide please. Question number one is the following. What exists and what is known about a school food and nutrition education in low and middle income countries? A very basic question where we really need the answers. Question number two, how these SFE interventions work? We need to know what are the barriers. We need to know what are the facilitators to make sure that these interventions work. Question number three, which is very much in line to the topic of this webinar is the following. What works for SFE to effectively promote healthy diets but also sustainable diets in different contexts and for those, more, uh, for those vulnerable populations. Question number four is what needs to be done to improve the current sf &E approaches in low and middle income countries? Now, these four questions lead our team at FAO to commission a series of studies at global and regional level, which I will briefly describe in the following slides. 
Next, please. So as part of our methodologies, of course, the first step was to establish the study objectives. And as you can see in this slide, uh, we had three objectives, all of them essential and related to each other. For example, the objective number one was to provide an overview of the state of school food and nutritional education interventions research in low and middle income countries by reviewing the current scientific literature. And in here, the, the term research is something that we would like to highlight. We wanted to see what countries, what type of research countries are doing in terms of SFE interventions. The objective number two was also to provide an overview of the state of the school food and nutrition education, but in this case, how do they work into governmental programs that have a school food and nutrition programs? And we did this through a global survey. And the final objective was integrating these two, the findings from these two objectives in order to identify commonalities, features, and gaps to better inform SFNE research and practice in low and middle income countries. In the following two slides, I will provide some basic characteristics of the study design that we follow, and then I will, I will finalize with the top findings from our studies. So in here, what you can see is the diagram uh, that we use for this study, this is a theory of change that we have developed for school food and nutrition education. It was our conceptual framework to guide our studies. And why? Because it helped us to collect and analyze the data in a more logical, relevant, and organized manner by taking into consideration factors such as the goals and outcomes of SFNE, the learning processes of, SS of SFNE, and the programmatic processes the core components and actors that are involved in a school food and nutrition education, and finally, its vision, principles, and scope, which goes beyond nutrition and health and includes other areas, such as agriculture, food systems, and the environment. Next. This slide summarizes the study design that we undertook in order to achieve the objective that I mentioned before which consisted on the following procedures and or steps. So first, we did an exploratory review of more than 40 systematic reviews of school-based interventions with a school food and nutrition education component. However, what we noticed is that the data came primarily from high-income countries. So that is why the second phase of this study was a fundamental piece. This was a global spoken review in which we put a strong emphasis on identifying a school food and nutrition education interventions from low and middle income countries. And we were able to identify 78 primary studies from 24 low and middle income countries. After completing this, let's say, phase of reviewing the literature, the scientific literature, then we conducted a global survey with more than 30 low and middle income countries that have, as I said before, a school food and nutrition program. So we wanted to see how do they integrate the school food and nutrition education component. And finally, we integrate the findings from all of these phases with the findings from additional studies that our FAO regional offices have been undertaking also in this area. We had several studies, regional studies in Africa, two in Latin America and the Caribbean, and another one in the Pacific Islands. At this moment, we are at the phase in where we have completed the data collection and analysis of all this data. And if we think about the initial questions that trigger this study that I shared with you at, at the beginning of this section, we can gladly say that we have accomplished our mission. And in the following slide, I will show you the top five findings. Next. All right, so we have many, many findings, yet given the time constraints, I will highlight the top five issues that require our attention and immediate action. Issue number one is in relation to research gaps. Research gaps in terms of the availability, 
of adequate and rigorous studies of school food and nutritional education in low and middle income countries. And what happens with this? Well, if we don't have enough or adequate studies, then this limits our availability to know how to adapt the school food and nutritional education interventions to low and middle income countries. And most importantly, it limits our ability to know how to institutionalize SFNE within the school systems. The issue number two, as you can see in this slide, is challenges related to enabling national policies and strategies and resources, financial resources, capacities, uh, for implementing in an adequate way a school food and nutrition education interventions. The issue number three is regarding the design of a school food and nutrition education. And here we have a lot of information, but just to mention a, a few, we found uh, issues in relation to the initial phase or planning of the SFN intervention if they use formative research or participatory techniques to inform the design of SFN interventions rather than use like to encourage a bottom-up approach rather than researchers telling people what to do, for example. Then if they use behavioral theories or learning models to understand and to know how to promote real behavioral change, but the issue was not if they just mentioned if they use a behavioral theory or not, but how do they actually use it? And then when it comes to the materials um, for the teachers or for the children, the trainees, the issue here was not if they have materials or not. Uh, the issue was if these materials, if these strategies actually fit the purpose of behavioral change rather than just providing knowledge about nutrition. The issue number four is regarding the quality of presence of a school food and nutrition into the school system. So here we found issues in terms of how SFNE is integrated in the curriculum, but also how it's integrated or linked it with the school food environments. We also found issues in terms of uh, how much time is allocated to SFNE, if it's an adequate time or not. Issues related to how much and what type of training do frontline educators receive. We had uh, one study, for example, where they did some focus groups and they um, highlight the need of receiving training on how to promote behavioral change. Teachers said that, that that was a very important need. And another issue within this category is the involvement of different actors. We commonly see children and teachers, but in the type of SFNE that we want to promote, we want the action of parents, families, uh, the school staff, the community, farmers. So we found issues in terms of if that involvement was a passive involvement versus an active involvement in the school food and nutritional education activities. And finally, issue number five is in relation to the lack of an evaluation culture. And this is very important because if we do not have evaluation data, then we, not, we cannot tell the, the, uh, the story about the effectiveness and what are the successful factors associated with, with that effectiveness. And in most cases, we identified that if the evaluation component was in there, it was pretty much focused on long-term outcomes and uh, implementation processes were not measured. In synthesis, this is where we are now. We have, as you can see, identified different issues which definite, definitely translate to us into very solid data that we did not have before in one place. And all this data we believe that can help all of us to better approach the needs of low and middle income countries in this important area of SFNE. So with this, I complete this section and now uh, we can go to the next section that my colleague Melissa is going to uh, share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Genori. Uh, can you all hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, so based on the findings and main issues that Genori mentioned, in particular those of methodological nature, we embark in a comprehensive process to identify the main evidence-based principles and the programmatic best practices that will enhance the effectiveness of SFNE in low and middle income countries. But considering, as Fatima mentioned in the introduction of the presentation, the criteria for effectiveness is a sustained improvement in food and nutrition practices and outlooks. So we then develop a learning model that applies all of these principles and best practices. Next slide, please. So the first overarching aspect that we found is that a change of mindset is required because food learning processes are owned and experienced by the participants, by children and adolescents, even with younger children, as food is a part of their daily lives and not limited to an educational subject. So even if SFN interventions are being designed by experts, curriculum developers, or other professionals, when implemented, they should not be considered as delivering education, but rather constructing and facilitating children's and adolescents' food learnings based on their own realities and experiences. So the first step in this was to change the language from a purely practitioner role to a facilitator role with putting children and adolescents and the school community at the center of the narrative. Considering this, if we want to help create healthy and sustainable food waste for the next generation, next slide please. First, we need to go beyond the knowledge paradigm. So one of the most pervasive assumptions that we found in the studies that Genori was mentioned is that SFNE um, is done mostly with a dissemination of information with the consideration that this will lead to increased knowledge in children and adolescents and that this enhanced knowledge is going to be sufficient to change their behaviors and practices. Yet evidence continues to contradict this paradigm with numerous models and approaches showing that food choices and behaviors are determined and influenced by many interacting and also evolving factors at different levels. It can be at individual, family, community, and policy levels. For example, from personal preferences in children and, and the parenting approaches to socio-cultural norms and food marketing. And that knowledge and understanding about nutrition is only a very limited part of this picture. Next slide, please. So here you can see a, a very oversimplified version of how this knowledge paradigm looks in practice. While well-intentioned, it is often implicit that all SFNE should focus on enhancing knowledge about the nutritional value of foods and food groups. This is what we find consistently in learning materials in curriculum. So this is reflected on the left with an activity where children need to memorize the most important food groups according to perhaps their country's national food-based dietary guidelines, but without any extension or application of the knowledge to their real life experiences. On the right, we can see again, perhaps an oversimplified example, but it, this is an activity of how a, a mental and practical approach and focus can be a, and done in practice to extend the learning of children to familiar and hands-on experiences. Next slide, please. So furthermore, uh, with this learning model, we identified that the main principles for effectiveness need to be meaningfully integrated from the design of interventions. And there should be need-based learning with real life practical aims. This means that the targets uh, the objectives, the learning objectives need to be in line uh, with the criteria for effectiveness, modifying them many times from academic results to actual competences, as Fatima mentioned. In other words, the aim needs to be changes or improvement or development in health promoting practices. At the same time, SFNE cannot be generic. It needs to be based on the main priorities, realities, and needs of the context. And this needs some degree or some level of formative research to set adequate aims or action competences that can support the improvement of the situation and the current issues. And these issues can be very widely varied. For example, high levels of anemia to issues with food hygiene and food safety to high consumptions of junk food to food waste. So this is often why learning materials 
should not be exported from one place to the other, from one country to the other, as it is many times done, without careful consideration of their utility or adaptability. Building on existing uh, experience and expertise, this means that by the, the time children arrive to school, they have at least five years of learned food expectations, habits, and preconceptions embedded in their bodies, hearts, and minds. A complex mix of experience, knowledge, practice, and expectations that were acquired at home. So this informal food learning cannot be ignored in SFNE and should be capitalized on. Then we need to incorporate plenty of observation and discussion. We found that activities of this nature, when meaningfully designed, are not only very important for children to reinforce their learning in the classroom, but actually as inputs for learning in the classroom. For example, by children observing food ways in their households or simple cooking techniques and sharing with their peers to establish baselines for improvements. Again, the action and the practice in real life settings. We need to stress this further because SFNE may be largely fruitless because food practices only establish themselves when they link to real life settings, including the home, the community. So this means going beyond the classroom and practicing target actions in the school premises, in the homes, or even in the markets. We also need to promote interactions with physical and social environments in all learning activities. And I will mention this uh, during my next slide. Family and community support and involvement are very important, as Jenori mentioned. This came out very strong in all the evidence of what works. For often essential reasons uh, that improved uh, food practices will not be maintained if they are not supported in the house or in the home. And because they have parents and caregivers have experience to share and they can act as role models for their children. More evidence, however, is needed on how to best involve parents uh, from schools because simply giving them information about the, the dynamics of the, of the um, SFNE in the schools is not sufficient. Uh, in any given context, there is the need to explore how to maximize parents' continuing interest and support uh, for SFNE in the school. Ownership of the process. I have mentioned this beforehand, but I would like to stress that children and their school communities are not passive actors for SFNE but rather they can take ownership of what they learn of their own food learning processes in various degrees. In some instances, adolescents have proven to be agents of change in their local food systems. And thus this needs to be explicit aim of SFNE. Next slide, please. Also, we need to broaden the scope because we know that food is often at the intersection of many sustainable development issues. But in real life, in children's and adolescents' life, the food cannot be separated from its sociocultural, economic implications. So SFNE is currently evolving, but it needs to evolve more to amplify the scope beyond individual diet or individual nutrition. This means considering food issues and setting objectives that can reflect this complexity. For instance, by having adolescents explore their own food systems or children explore where food comes from. The next slide, please. Okay, so at the same time, integrated approaches need to be prioritized. In many occasions, we found during this process of designing the learning model that the discourse was one of competition between education and, or food environment policy interventions. Uh, many times it is shown what works, what doesn't work, and what needs more resources and what needs to be de-emphasized. But we know that, and the evidence shows that multi-component approaches are more effective than isolated ones. For example, uh, complementing food environment policies, such as restriction, restricting the sale of sugar-sweetened beverages in schools with SFNE is more effective for improving diet practices than implementing the food policy alone. We see this many times, especially in schools the interactions between education and environmental actions and policies are consistently found to produce a great deal more than the sum of its parts. So in many cases, SFNE is being increasingly designed and implemented as a complement to food environment policies, but also as food security and social protection programs as a complement to this, because SFNE can 
ensure that increased availability and accessibility of nutritious foods can be translated into improved consumption and food practices. But we realize that these complementarities do not end here. Environments shape food choices and food demand can shape food supply and food environments. So we need consistent approaches that capitalize on these complementarities. So this means that SFE is not only designed to support environmental policies in the schools, but it means that food environments in and beyond the school can be used as educational inputs. For example, a simple uh, um, example is using food environments that are familiar for school children, for example, markets or uh, restaurants or food places close to the school as places for exploration and action and to be used as inputs. Next slide, please. So this once again is an oversimplified example, but it shows how food environments can be used as a learning input for SFNE. So this means that we can also educationalize food environments. The next slide, please. Okay, finally, we need to tell the world. As Genori was mentioning, there are many research gaps and we need to ensure that to prove effectiveness, we are investing also in evaluation and research. We need to improve accountability of the interventions that are done uh, in the school curricula, but also development interventions. Uh, as Genori mentioned, there are many gaps, there are many research gaps, uh, and I will not mention this again, but for example, we need to show which education environmental approaches work best for addressing overweight and obesity. We also need to share lessons learned practically. That this is why we discovered that in the literature, uh, there was not much about implementation science. And this is what we, we needed to show in the learning model. So we know that this is all very ambitious for school systems in low and middle income countries, especially considering the policy, institutional and capacity challenges that Genori mentioned. But now I want to give the microphone to Fatima to answer our last question, which aims to close this gap as FAO work in supporting low and middle income countries to improve the effectiveness of SFNE. Fatima? Uh, uh, now we will look at the... Uh... Yeah, we will look at the last question, and um, uh, and that is what FAO is doing in support of governments uh, to enhance the effectiveness and scope of SFNE uh, interventions. So, uh, uh, as we have heard, there's, there was a lot of work on the evidence base, uh, and then on our uh, uh, approach and the uh, vision for SFNE to be more effective and also on the need for integration. So building on this, FAO uh, has, has uh, 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 put together a framework that links all uh, different pillars uh, in the uh, school food and nutrition uh, area or uh, in the, uh, field to each other. So these pillars uh, are uh, in our model four. You see that the school community is at the center. And then uh, a, a, the, there's the, a pillar on inclusive procurement and value chains, another pillar on the healthy food environment and school food, and then a third on the food and nutrition education, and the fourth pillar is on the enabling uh, policy and legal uh, environment. Now these weave into each other uh, and they interact uh, among each other uh, in, a, in, a, in a holistic way. So the second slide, please. Or the next slide, please. Yes, so here are examples on what FAO has been doing uh, under uh, the different uh, uh, pillars 
in such an integrated way. So we have school food and nutrition education in our procurement projects. That is the green on, on your school, uh, on your screen. You can, we can also, we have also school uh, food and nutrition education in, in projects that uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, school meal standards and uh, guidelines, nutrition guidelines, and other food environment policies. We have a legal uh, guide uh, that includes school food and nutrition education under the policy arm and under the food and nutrition education there are a lot of work happening there uh, in uh, countries uh, we have uh, 14 countries in latin america and the caribbean assisted uh, in really in relation to school uh, um, pro, uh, school programs or projects where school food and nutrition education is very important in malawi in kenya in mozambique uh, in uh, tajikistan in many countries and we do use different for, uh, platforms for learning so we use a lot the school gardens for improving the nutrition uh, as a platform we do teacher uh, training and we do also curricula uh, uh, development so we have a lot uh, going in the area of schools uh, uh, around the world in 2020 we will be uh, uh, producing or uh, 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 dis uh, disseminating a toolbox based on what uh, Melissa and uh, Yonori ha uh, have presented. Uh, there's the white paper on the um, uh, principles, challenge, uh, challenges, and recommendations for a more effective school food and nutrition education. There's a capacity needs assessment tool that is now be, uh, we will be piloting it, but it will be uh, uh, shared with the whole world in 2020. The literature review, and we have a global survey that is going to be also published and some regional surveys that have already been uh, uh, conducted and uh, some results are on the internet, but they, they are part of our uh, toolbox. Uh, next, please. So uh, our next steps, we will continue with the capacity development at country level uh, for individuals, for institutions, for uh, uh, the policy settings. We will be uh, continuing, as I said, with the capacity needs assessment tool uh, piloting. We will be developing uh, e-learning modules, workshops, and um, uh, other activities at country level. Uh, we, uh, we have as part of our activities communication and advocacy. So we will be presenting our uh, new vision uh, in GCNF uh, in Cambodia in December. Also, we will be uh, launching our white paper in the World Public Health and Nutrition Association meeting in Australia in March. Uh, uh, we have uh, we are working on policy briefs and other digital campaigns. Uh, uh, in terms of country support, we are continuing the support to countries as uh, needs arise and uh, in the areas that I explained. That we have also in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, a new uh, initiative on certification and school food, uh, school food, school food and nutrition education. And uh, we have work in the uh, SITS in the Pacific uh, ongoing and we are uh, uh, building our partnerships with uh, um, agencies and organizations that uh, have a focus on education and the nutrition education like UNESCO, like Save the Children. And also we are working with universities uh, like uh, Queensland, uh, Queensland University of Technology in Australia. So these are uh, some of the things that we will be doing next year and the year after. And uh, we are, uh, uh, we welcome all partnerships in this area. And to, to, to uh, end this presentation, I will just uh, present to you some of our documents. So next, please. You will see on, uh, on this slide uh, some of the resources that we have related to schools. Uh, on uh, the right hand side of the screen, there is uh, our latest uh, BORN. It's an activity book that was developed for the uh, World Food Day. Uh, but you can also see the titles of some of the work uh, that ha we have been doing in, in schools. There's a nice video, video that we have um, uh, developed to explain our vision on school food and nutrition education. Uh, you will find the link on the, on the next slide. So next, please. 
Um, yes, this, the one in the middle is a very short uh, video that, uh, that gives you the idea of this integrated approach and the, uh, the, how we see uh, nutrition education uh, becoming more effective. And for more information, you have these links on this slide. And I thank you very much for, your, uh, uh, for listening and for the time that you have given us uh, this afternoon or morning, according to where you are in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Fatima, Melissa, and Inori for the very comprehensive presentation. We do have some time for question and answers. Um, everybody has been muted. If you want, you can either type in a question or you can unmute yourself and ask a question if you have any. Um, are there any burning questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Hi, this is Jeannie Long. I'm on the School of the Nutrition team, so I'll just get a uh, question started while I'm sure there will be others in the chat box. Um, I was wondering what your research showed about the best way to implement some of your recommendations. Um, in many of the countries where we work, nutrition education isn't the only health topic that we want integrated into the curricula and into the school day. And it requires teachers that need training in order to do this well because they're having to often learn about the topic and then learn how to teach it across different grades. So how much training do teachers need to do this well and how is that balanced with the other demands that teachers and schools have? So, um, Fatima, Melissa, or Yanari, I don't know who wants to take that question. And you are all muted, so you have to unmute yourself to answer the question. Uh, okay, this is Yanari. Uh, oh, Great. We can hear you. Okay, so the research that we did was to learn what is known about school food and nutrition education in low and middle income countries. So I, I want to clarify in here that perhaps we did not identify a best example. They were more like issues in relation to this because the type of training that we saw is that it was a one shot training about general nutrition and with this was expected that SFNE has to be implemented and delivered in an adequate way. So I wanted to make that clarification that we identified the issues from the research that we identified from low and middle income countries with this regard. From high and income countries, we found different examples where the trainings are provided in a, a series of trainings are provided to the frontline educators. And these series of trainings in some cases are integrated with other health education areas and not only focus on the content, let's say if it's WASH or food safety or if it's nutrition, but they also provide soft competences in terms of how to deliver a adequate food and nutrition education. So behavioral change techniques, techniques in terms of how to develop a learning materials and so on. So what I want to say now is that with the findings from the high income countries and then with the issues that we found from low and middle income countries, we have uh, the, the document that we have put together that Fatima mentioned, the white paper that is going to be launched next year in where we have put together a series of recommendations based on what we have learned from the research to know how to improve this area. So I will pass it now to Melissa to see if she would like to add more on this in relation to uh, some of the main findings or recommendations that we included in the white paper. Yes, uh, thank you, Janori. Yes, I, we, we also, we found out, for example, in the survey that um, food and nutrition education is being integrated in the curricula in different ways. Um, we have to say that it many times is mostly extracurricular and more and more it has been linked to school meal programs or school food and nutrition programs, uh, which are outside from the, from the, um, general curriculum and in cases where it is integrated into the uh, curriculum many times it's not associated with health sometimes it is but it is in home economics uh, in in other subjects so uh, sometimes what we try to do in the white paper especially we have um, 
we have made it so that we, we have divided by themes and one of the themes is exactly capacity development. And the, all the themes are structured in the same way and they have challenges and recommendations. We know that a big challenge is that many times our responsibility falls on teachers specifically because these are the main educators at, at the school level. It, although sometimes they, they, they have NGO um, staff or volunteers from the community that are also educators. But many times the, the, um, the, the, the role is, is almost of the, of the teacher. Um, some countries have, low and middle income countries have implemented training systems specifically for food and nutrition education. Some are integrated into health education if they have a curriculum. But it, it's not, a, it's, first yes, it's the training that it, it's, it's not enough, but more than that is the capacity development is not integrated, it's not institutionalized, for example, in teacher training curricula. Um, when we inquired with different levels at policy level, at institutional level, also at individual level in, in the teachers, uh, many times it is, it is said that uh, they don't feel that they have the confidence, the capacities to address uh, for, for instance, behavior focused uh, food and nutrition education. Uh, and many times, yes, as you rightly say, they don't have the time, uh, they have time constraints to do it, and they don't have the learning materials that because some of them are very interested in it, but they feel that they don't have the learning materials, so sometimes they, they find their own. So we, we drafted some, some recommendations on this, uh, specifically on how to institutionalize it into the teacher training curricula, but also how to integrate it in, at policy level so it has budget allocated to it and it has time allocated to it in the teacher training curriculum and at the same time in the school curriculum because we cannot really um, guarantee the sustainability of, of extracurricular activities. Um, some of the recommendations they, they touch upon how what are the best um, the different trainings, pre-service training or in-service training and how this can be joined with, the, with all their health education trainings just to, to, to ensure that there is not a lot of pressure on the teachers. And at the same time, how we can, we can monitor the, the times that they, that they have in the actual classroom uh, and what are, what are their main needs in terms of that? As, as Genori said, in, in many high income countries, they have done this already and they have built learning programs on this. But uh, the recommendations that we have are more progressive and, and how to find linkages with already existing training, um, training curriculums for the teachers. Great. Right. I don't know, Fatima, if you want to add anything else to it, but. Um, thanks to Melissa and Yanari for identifying the challenges of, of actually introducing really good school-based um, nutrition education. I actually have a quick question. In reviewing the, um, what's out there, did you notice that at least whether the information was accurate? Um, so we're talking about the difficulty of actually doing health uh, nutrition education. But I, well, I'm curious of at least whether the, the information that's out there for teachers and, and parents to access, are they accurate information or do they need to be also improved? Um, well, thank you, Sun. This is a very good question. Um, it's about the content. So in general, what we saw in terms of content is that they either talk about general nutrition or in some cases, they focus on some specific behaviors, like for example, promoting the consumption of fruit and vegetables in conjunction with physical activity. So if, if we have to divine that way of how they approach content, I will say that we either have general nutrition or a behavioral focus type of um, approach. Uh, if it was accurate or not, uh, one issue that we have from the research is that these type of details are not necessarily well explained in the research. So that is why for us it was also very important to do the global survey. And another step that we are aiming to do perhaps in the future is to look at the great literature to manuals or things like that or curriculum. So to do for example, curriculum content analysis. But uh, I believe, I strongly believe that more work has to be done on this. 
Why? Because it's not only about the content. We believe that when we will go to countries and provide support, they have to have an idea uh, of how the change is going to happen. Like we showed before, we, we have put together a theory of change so that people in the field can work in some way retrospectively to understand what are the goals, the outcomes that are more in terms of changing competences, skills, and how do we actually, uh, or what type of strategies do we need to achieve these uh, expected goals and, uh, and outcomes. And why I mention this, because for example, the content, uh, in some cases it was about less memorizing the nutrients. And depending on the countries, uh, I want to highlight here, perhaps they do not have food-based dietary guidelines. So most of the information perhaps was taken from high end income countries, they may use other dietary guidelines. So there are like little details here and there where you identify that more guidance is definitely needed, not only in the content, but in the whole process. And again, uh, as Melissa mentioned, the white paper is divided in different sections and one uh, really covers this area, how to develop the competences, how to develop the learning models and the different materials and strategies. And so we hope that we can provide more guidance on this because really there, there is a need on how to improve the content that is provided to children in line to the ultimate goal that we want to achieve that is promote not only healthy diets, but also in, in, in alignment with promoting a healthy a lifestyle, but also <coughs> healthy planet nowadays with all the issues that Fatima mentioned at the beginning. Melissa, I don't know if you would like to add something to Yes. Yeah, just two, two things about the about Sung's question. Um, um, FAO, in a partnership with UNESCO, conducted a study in RLC where they did actual content analysis of the curriculum in, in uh, SFNE. And they found that, as, as I was saying, sometimes teachers do not have learning materials, uh, uh, um, learning materials that are national and they have to find their own resources and they say that many times it was some minutes before the classroom so they just find the the resources and the information from from the web or from uh, old materials that they have uh, many times as, as generally mentioned they end up using food-based dietary guidelines of other countries even, even if they have national ones um, so this is this is a very important situation. One of the main um, capacity targets that we are recommending in the white paper is one on the one hand for educators to be able to uh, use learning materials that are targeted for their context and that of course is based on evidence uh, based information um, and where to look for additional resources, which, which are the best places to, to get them and, and to have networks in between them because this is part of the extended capacity of institutionalizing capacity to, for them to have the places to get these resources. And the second one is that also at the uh, children and adolescents level, one of the main competences, as we call them, the learning objectives that we call them, is um, in situations where they can identify pervasive info, um, marketing, for example, or, or wrong information, how can they identify a, and how can they be critical towards that? This is one of the main things that is mostly for, for older uh, children, for adolescents, but um, this is in line with uh, in, the, in the current uh, world that we are living in on the, on the information, the, the amount and the vast information that is not often real. And, and correct, it is one of the capacities that, uh, of the competences that we are also exploring in the white paper. Over. Great. Thank you very much, Melissa, um, Yanari, and, and Fatima. I do want to close on time. For um, those who want to see the, the recording, these, the FRESH webinars can be found in three sites, the FRESH partnership site, um, and, and then the Save the Children Research Center, and then UNESCO's HIV AIDS and educa Health Education Clearinghouse. So there are three opportunities for you to be able to share the recording of this webinar. And these are in the webinar um, invites. The next webinar will be Friday, November 15th. And the topic will be washing schools and link to the World Toilet Day, uh, which is um, uh, in November. By the way, today is, is, is World um, Hand Washing Day, which is very relevant to nutrition education and WASH. 
but the next webinar will be November 15th. They will be an invite early November. Again, thanks to all the people who um, joined us and thank you to the speakers. And we're signing off. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.